Um, just to give you a little bit more background, I got involved with this back in about starting about 2005. I started writing on my own blog, then I got involved with the oil drum. Uh, and in uh, late 2007, I could see the economy was going straight downhill. Well, I could see what was happening. And I uh, wrote a, an article on the oil drum forecasting essentially the collapse we saw in late 2008. And after that happened, Charlie Hall invited me to come and give a talk at the 2009 Biophysical Economics uh, Conference. And then various other things happened. There were many people at that, like Professor Fung. Uh, and then eventually I gave other talks other places. I ended up writing up a paper about it, explaining it was really a two-fold problem. It wasn't just the oil prices, it was also a debt crisis. And so what happened was I ended up meeting with all kinds of people from all strands of energy insight, or maybe not even energy, maybe more physics, all kinds of strange different areas. And on both the oil drum and on our finite world, there's a place for comments. So all of these people would write to me and say, if you want a more complete theory, you should look at X. So I'd go look at X. So what I ended up happening was I had started trying to put together something that was not really the uh, biophysical economics theory that everybody hears. It was, well, what are other people seeing from other disciplines and how, what does this look like? Well, it turns out it looks fairly different from what people here have been assuming is the case. So it makes it a little bit difficult to try to explain, but I will try. Anyway, so uh, this is an outline of the points that, there's some luck I can go through at least some of them. Anyhow, how the economy works is an energy-based self-organized system. Today's economy is following the path of early economies that collapsed. Per capita energy consumption needs to rise. It's not something that people have really looked at. We can't count on energy prices rising even if Eroy falls. And this is something that you know we've had several speakers who have assumed that the prices are going to go up. This is not at all obvious. Uh, growing debt plays many important roles. I think people tend to discount this. The financial system is just terribly important. And in today's world, you can't simply uh, forgive debt and start over. It, it, what it ends up doing is it collapses the whole system. So let me go. So the first section. Now this is something, the entire universe seems to be organized by flows of energy. I think most people here have been educated to talk about we have a closed system and we're running out of a finite amount of energy and, and this is uh, the way everything is and this is all we, this is our big problem of the world is this closed system we're working in. Uh, and what seems to be the case, which is looking at it from a different perspective, is the whole universe acts very much like an open system. Uh, if you go back and look at it, it started with the very smallest atoms. And then uh, after the Big Bang, it gradually worked up to more and more energy intense systems. Uh, you know, bigger atoms than molecules, than uh, whatever. Uh, Eric Chasson has various charts that look sort of like this. But it goes, uh, the self organization goes towards galaxies, stars, planets plants, animals, and then he's saying, he has this as an energy density rate. The brains within animals are even more energy intense, and what he calls society is what you and I would call an economy, is the most energy dense. But there's this trend, it's this uh, flow of energy that pushes everything towards higher energy density. And we all say, 
oh, everybody should just change the way they act, but there's this flow uh, and this force that we don't really understand that, uh, that causes this rise in complexity in nature. Uh, and now if we look at humans, what seems to have happened is that humans are different from animals because we have learned to control the energy of fire. And we, in fact, we learned to control it over a million years ago. And uh, this control of fire had a number of different kinds of impacts. Uh, one of the big ones was that we could cook our food. And when we cooked our food, we didn't need to chew it as long. We could get better nutrition from it. And our bodies could adapt uh, in such a way that uh, we didn't need as big teeth and big jaws and a big uh, digestive system. So what happened was there was more energy for a brain. But this was all related to this issue of the fact that we had control of fire. And, and of course, this is what gave us the advantage over these other animals. And we started back in hunter-gatherer times of killing off the other species. We were burning down forests in order to find the uh, animals we wanted to eat. So it's not something that's a fossil fuel problem. It's a problem with the fact that humans have control of energy and have had it since hunter-gatherer days. And so, of course, this advantage allowed human population to rise and that fossil fuel just added to this advantage. Uh, and so what happened as we grew and as population grew, then there needed to be a way to add more energy. So the question is, what do you do? And the big thing that comes along is complexity. And I'm sure all of you heard, have heard of Joseph uh, Tainter and the uh, complex, the, the fall of complex societies. Uh, and what happens here is that complexity has its own limits. Uh, but this complexity that gives you different roles it's what about you add more technology and you have more promises and it allows you to accommodate all of this additional energy but it also changes the whole nature of the system you end up with more hierarchical arrangement uh, you know it's not just everybody's a hunter-gatherer uh, you can gradually add more and more roles you know you have uh, a big government and you'll have layers that come on. And so what happens, as you add complexity, you have this pecking order. And what happens to try to make this <laughs> growing thing is you keep add, pushing more and more energy towards the top. The governments keep getting bigger and bigger. They add NAFTA, they add whatever, and then the, there's the largest corporation they tend to grow through globalization. And you end up with the people with the advanced training, they uh, get uh, higher positions within these corporations. So they're the ones who get the big pieces of uh, the output. And what tends to happen to make the system collapse is this thing, the people with no special training and the people at the bottom of the hierarchy, they tend to get left out. They may lose their jobs altogether or they don't get paid enough. And they are really the big buyers in the system. They're the ones that need to, there's so many of them, like if it's 80% or 90%, they're the, they all have to have homes to live in, they need uh, some kind of transportation, but if their price, if their wages go down too far because of NAFTA or because of anything else, that's what causes the big collapses that we see. Uh, I show here one chart I've given as an example of how I see the economy working. And it's uh, 
a self-organized system and it builds on itself. You know, you have at any point in time a group of businesses and a group of uh, consumers and you have uh, an energy supply and all of these different things and new businesses form when they see opportunities and then the consumers decide what they're going to buy based on what uh, the others, uh, what products are available, uh, and of course you have laws and taxes, and all of these things are changing and they feed back on each other. And the thing that happens that um, becomes a problem is what I just mentioned before, and I have it down at the bottom, that the, the non-elite workers, this, this big group of people, are the ones who are both the primary workers in the system and the primary consumers in the system. And if you don't get enough money down to them, the whole thing goes for clunk. And uh, this is a different way I visualize the economy. And so we have the inputs on the far left end, and then we have uh, the basically entropy products on this side, and then we have the economy that kind of goes like a rocket straight up. And so, uh, you know, and there's tools and technology allows us to use the minerals and the energy, uh, but, and they're important, but there's all these other pieces too. So there's a temptation to say, you know, well, if we just model this other energy, that gets us far enough. and it, and it does for certain purposes. But in some purposes, you really have to be looking at the other pieces. Uh, so what causes the economy's ultimate problem? Uh, is it running short of oil? Or is it inadequate total fuel for that rocket? The economy grows too slowly, so there are too few jobs. Or is it the entropy issues that I show coming off the end? Like, just too much debt. Uh, the question I don't think the boilers have asked is when does this problem really come? Does it come when it peaks? Or does it come when uh, at some sooner point? Uh, what causes the economic, is there an economic problem that causes oil to peak? And in fact, coal and natural gas and everything else at the same time. Uh, this physics story has been changing since the 1970s. The 1970s story was most systems are energetically closed. We run out of energy supplies. I know John Shramsky's big article, and one of them is, is the closed system uh, approach, and I, that's the standard approach. But this open, what happens really is they uh, economy or the system operates as an open system, and these self-organized uh, things that are various types of things that are formed by self-organizations are not permanent. We know the sun is not going to last forever. We know the earth is not going to last forever. We know humans are not going to live forever, and hur hurricanes don't either. But what happens is that the economies can't last forever either. And uh, so, you know, this is why we need to look a little bit farther. Uh, the way I see it is that Eroy is like a, a flat map. It's looking primarily at the inputs. And you, sometimes you need a three-dimensional model or four or five uh, just because there are other considerations. And we, of course, we don't stop using flat maps in the three-dimensional world. The issue is that we have to be very careful when we're using EROI because you may get very distorted results if, you know, as we saw before, there are a lot of problems that can cause a particular option to fail and it may be one of those entropy problems or it may be the fact that you can't get enough out in total that causes this new substitute to fail. 
And the fact that you are choosing to look at only one piece of the problem, which happens to be the big piece for fossil fuels, uh, you know, can get you into trouble. Uh, now, there's been a fair amount of research as to what's happened to economies that have collapsed. Uh, I sometimes, if any of you read my articles, I've talked about secular cycles by Turchin and Nevada, and they look uh, at a number eight in one of their books, uh, talking about how specifically these economies collapsed. And the big thing they're looking at or concerned about is carrying capacity, which is pretty close to ener annual energy consumed divided by population. It's what we talk about with animals, but with humans, you've got to add on what the value of the forests they're getting or the fossil fuels they're getting. Uh, but there's a per capita energy consumption that needs to be higher. Um, the pattern that they follow, uh, they talk about, is that an economy will come upon a new resource, for instance, through winning a war, or cutting down trees. Well, once they've got this new big area, they can grow rapidly for a while. But then what happens is that they uh, reach ca the carrying capacity. And when they reach the carrying capacity, they uh, start a, a stagflation period. And uh, this is where uh, they start running into some more problems. Uh, and then eventually a collapse occurs. And there's a timing involved in this. The way they see this is that, well, I say that the growth period goes for a over 100 years. and. What I show on my graph is that for this, these eight economies they were looking at, it was like 180 years. But it goes for quite a while that you get several generations who can use up the resources that are available within that area before they go have to win a war against somebody else and expand to a new area or whatever it is. But then after they use up those resources, they get to a period they can add complexity but that complexity causes problems. This is where you get to wage disparity. And then once you've got too much wage disparity, then you get the crisis period and the inner cycle. And so I talked a little bit about this. And debt defaults, of course, come in this. Uh, one of the big things that happens with collapse is that governments can't collect enough taxes uh, because that 80% are so poor, the governments depend on, getting, on having enough people to collect the taxes from. The businesses can run away to a different country. This is what we've had problems with. And so you can't count on getting taxes from the businesses. You gotta get it from the, the uh, low income people. But if they're too low income, you can't do that. And then of course workers, succumb to epi epidemics as they become poorer. Uh, is peak oil a new and different problem? I don't really think so. It, it really is an issue whether it's, you know what, we talk about an uh, it's an energy consumed divided by population that gets to be important. And back in those days, well it varied whether it was the numerator or the denominator, but uh, the, the, the population, the fact the population was growing was enough by itself to cause the economy to collapse. But of course there was also erosion of the topsoil and a added salinity to the soil, so there were a lot of different things pushing towards collapse. <coughs> uh, and of course, now we started using fossil fuels over 200 years ago, so we're kind of following the same timeline. And if you look at it, our big growth in energy use was uh, stopped in the, well, in the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Once the growth in energy use we stopped, 
we had to start using more and more complexity, more and more debt, to try to fix the situation. Uh, and so what happens is that there's a big increase in wage disparity. And what happened in the earlier years, if you look at that first graph I show over here, you see that the wages went up. Uh, and this is, these are inflation adjusted wages. And even for the lower wage people, when we were adding lots of energy to the economy, it was going through as wages. But then between 70 and 80, 1970 and 1980, it leveled off. But then we started with the complexity stuff. The complexity stuff is the stuff that you know, sends more money to the top and less to the bottom. And so what happens, uh, this is one that's now, is this Piketty graph that you see here, the second one I'm showing, where we're back to the 1920s situation with a similar amount of wage disparity because we've pushed the economy as we've added more and more of this complexity, we pushed it so that the owners of these big machines are the ones that get the big output of the economy and the core workers are competing with people in Africa or India or something that will work for 20 or $30 a month. Uh, if we, the question is how fast does the energy consumption need to rise? And if you look at the graph, the energy consumption is consistently rising. Uh, but we can look at it on a per capita basis as well. And what you see here is that there are a couple of obvious flat periods in it. One of them was the 1920 to 1940 period, and another was the 1980 to 2000 period. Uh, and let's see, the 1920 to 1940 period, as we remember, this is <laughs> the World War I, World War II depression period. This is not what you want to rerun out of. Uh, and of course, this is when we raised tariffs before. Uh, it was Hitler, it was the Holocaust, uh, and the uh, World War II was what got us out of it because that was what they used to pump up demand and get wages back down to the bottom level again. The 1980 to 2000 period was different because that followed the period where we had already shifted to smaller cars and we were doing all kinds of things to change our energy use. But what happened was the Soviet Union, uh, you know, we didn't need as much oil as we did uh, reduce the size of the cars and we got, became more efficient, but that lowered the prices. And so some oil exporter was going to have to go. Well, it ended up was, it was the Soviet Union. And their central government collapsed in 1991. This is st following the standard collapse kind of situation where it's the central government that collapses they can't collect enough tax dollars. Uh, and now, since 2010, what we're seeing is another flat period forming. And the, the flat period is the kind of thing that you see, that you expect to start seeing the same kind of problems arising. To me, this flat period has some similarities to back to the, uh, 1920 to uh, 1940 period. It's not one where we've gotten a flat period by, uh, you know, our conscious, you know, moving to much smaller cars. What where we got the flat period from was by reducing the coal consumption. And a big piece of that was because of the pollution problems. So, you know, everybody's got their eyes so focused on oil they can't look at coal. You know, sort of like, oh yeah, oil is our problem, it's our only problem. Well, no it isn't. We have to keep the total energy supply. And so what I see is that you really have to have increasing per capita energy consumption. Uh, and the 
what happens is that this energy is really related to carrying capacity. Uh, logically, you would need it sort of to be equivalent to what you need for that energy goes back to each of these workers. But what happens as you're having this disparity kind of thing happening is that you have several different things that are taking energy supply away from what the individual workers are going to be able to, to use. Uh, part of it's this diminishing returns kind of thing. It's the eroid problem. Part of it is just the fact that when you're adding all of these machines that are used by businesses and governments, that takes a big hunk of the energy supply out of the the general economy where these other people will be using it. And then part of the problem has to do with the complexity. Putting more of the energy at the top means there's less for the bottom. And then we have the things with, we're going to do globalization. That means there's a lot of energy used in the long distance transport. So what happens is you end up with these poor workers becoming literally poorer and poorer. Uh, I put together a little bit different chart of how 10-year uh, averages on how oil production or energy production, uh, energy consumption uh, has changed uh, by 10-year periods starting from 1820. And what you can see is that population has been, you know, in early periods, the population growth is pretty slow. And then we gradually increase the population growth uh, as we had more energy supply. And then what happens is that in these periods where we had peaks, that's when the economy did really pretty well. Uh, you know, in the 1910 period, that was when we had the early um, streetcars and people started getting uh, some of the, we started putting uh, some fact, some tractors out for farmers to use. Uh, and then the post-war boom, we had people moving to the suburbs and uh, many families could afford a car for the first time. And then we kind of ran short on that oil and then China saved us for a while. So we had these big pieces. And as I looked at that, I saw the little dip, so I looked to see what was going on. And of course, we had some panics back in the time we had the dip in the 1860 period that was almost too small to look up and to show in the graph before. Uh, one of the concerns I have now is that China's energy production has been collapsing. I I haven't looked at the new numbers that just came out. I think I'm pretty sure that the coal is up this year uh, for various reasons. Uh, but what happens is if China is producing less, we need more elsewhere. And that becomes a concern. Uh, this is an issue that we have people don't think about. We can't count on energy prices rising even if E-Roy falls. Uh, Roger Fouquet uh, has this chart where he shows that the price of energy services uh, tends to fall, and it falls quite steeply. Uh, and let me see. And what happens, of course, is that the cost share keeps falling. Uh, uh, what happens too is that we have a situation where no price works. Uh, the, the price is uh, it's either too high for the consumers or it's uh, too low for the producers. It's both of those things. And you use debt to pull it up and more debt to pull it up. Uh, so what, anyhow. I, I don't really have time to go through some of these things. Maybe I can go to my conclusions and see the things. Uh, the resource limits li seem likely to play out as an economic collapse rather than following the peak oil scenario. 
Worldwide, energy consumption needs to grow more rapidly than population or fighting over resources is likely. In the 1920 to 1940 period, we had a period when economic energy consumption was increasing only as the population grows. Uh, this was a dreadful period, and it may be similar to, it seems to be similar to what we're running not, into now. And in fact, I'm concerned about another crash similar to, but worse than, the 2008 crash. Uh, we can't count on high energy prices as limits hit, the prices tend to go down. One of the slides I, uh, I skipped was showing that the supply and demand model that we look at is two-dimensional and we need a three-dimensional model or four or five-dimensional model. The fact that the economists have that uh, particular model is not right near limits. It's a different situation near limits. Uh, the way I see it, we should expect actual fossil fuel extraction to be less than estimated by Hubbard linearization. Uh, low prices may cause governments of oil exporters to collapse. Financial problems are likely to reduce the amounts consumers can afford. There's no possibility of a steady state economy. It, the only possibility is it goes up or it goes down. <laughs> and if it goes down, it can go down pretty badly. Uh, when overall energy consumption per capita is not growing, the amount of energy services getting back to non-elite workers tends to fall. And anyhow, oh, if, if I look at, you have to keep pumping up debt to keep prices rising. And that's what's allowed the whole economy to grow and prices to allow, allowed us to pull more and more extraction out. And the way, what happened is the last time we were able to do this uh, without keeping doubling up the amounts of debt was back when oil was less than $20 a barrel. So it corresponds to an ROI of 50 or more. Uh, so this is not, you know, something that, uh, you know, there isn't a sustainable level within EROI. There's just so much debt, it's several times the amount of GDP that's added for any dollar of debt. And it becomes impossible without a terribly high EROI for this to happen. And I don't see walking away from debt and starting over being an option. Thank you. Thank you.